first question. It's hopefully getting warmer. People are getting vaccinated. When can we be done with staying at home and wearing masks? Well, I'll take the first stab at that one and then hopefully some of our other colleagues will, will chime in on it. I think that we're premature in getting away from masks and social distancing at this particular time. We want to wait until we have more people immune either through having experienced the disease or through vaccination and hopefully both. If you get the disease, you also end up being vaccinated. But there are other reasons that we continue to wear our masks at this time that we didn't really have a chance to experience in previous years. And one of those is we've seen a huge drop in the amount of influenza in our local community in Colorado and throughout our country. It's at one of the lowest levels that we've recorded in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And a lot of that is due to social distancing and also wearing masks. So there are benefits outside of preventing COVID-19. And uh, we ought to look at this, I think, on a, a long-term basis and see really uh, when it would be good to get totally away from that. But uh, we've, we've realized a lot of benefits that we didn't think about before we uh, started wearing these masks. So I'd say, you know, wait for the summer, maybe a little bit further, wait until we have more proven herd immunity and the uh, transmissions have really, really dropped off. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Bob. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit too early to um, start considering dropping uh, masks, especially since um, while the vaccines that we have rolled out um, have proven to be safe through the uh, phase one and two clinical trials, uh, you know, we haven't um, taken our time with those phase three uh, um, results that we normally would have um, um, during a non-pandemic uh, rollout of a vaccine. So some of the unanswered questions uh, that remain are, do you, if, if you're vaccinated, um, are you still susceptible to uh, being infected? And, and if so, can you still spread uh, the virus? Uh, it's likely that you, even if you are infected, you carry a, a lower viral burden. But these are the questions that we don't have solid answers to yet because we would normally take a little bit longer during that phase three to answer some of these more long-term questions. So uh, without that information, I think the CDC um, and Dr. Fauci continues to message that uh, we should continue to wear our masks just in case uh, vaccinated folks can still carry a low-level viral infection that might be transmissible. Uh, having said that though, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see the CDC recommending that if uh, you know um, two groups of, of folks uh, uh, have been vaccinated, they can meet together um, and, and be in closer contact um, and, and meet sort of more normally than uh, we have during the pandemic. Um, so that's all good news, but we wanna make sure we take a measured approach so that we don't take steps backwards. Um, you have noticed that as we vaccinate folks, um, uh, the infection rate has gone down, especially among seniors who were the first groups targeted for vaccinations. That is all great news. But um, it's, it's still um, early and we've seen those infection levels, uh, those daily infection counts level off since then. And also you, you've probably heard the emergence of these new variant coronavirus strains. Uh, and while the early data does look like the vaccines are still effective, um, that's also data that we don't, uh, that, that is incomplete. And so um, because of those two things, I think it's, as Bob said, extremely important to continue to wear masks so that we don't stop our efforts early. We've come so far, um, let's not backtrack now and let's just err on the side of caution and keep wearing those masks. Going along with herd immunity, um, now that I'm vaccinated, I want to go traveling. Do I need to wait for herd immunity or can I go ahead and go? I will take a first swipe at that one and then definitely encourage my colleagues here to, um, 
to jump in. So this is a complicated question to unpack because one of the things that both Mark and Bob were kind of getting to is this concept that there's a difference between what public health guidelines are made to achieve and what individual health guidelines are made to achieve. And they're not they're not completely separate. Obviously, they're very independent. But when you hear um, a lot of the, the CDC and other guidelines are really um, targeted toward large groups of people, right? So the risk to the world still is relatively high for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned. There's still quite a bit of disease out there. People are still getting sick. Um, there are these variants that are a little bit harder to get your finger on in terms of how they're being transmitted and how resistant they may be to the vaccine, although so far so good, we, we feel like. Um, and, and so the, the risk to a, the population is still high out there. And that's why the mask mandates or the mask recommendations are still in place in many places. The risk to a vaccinated individual is different, right? So you're, you are definitely lower risk than you were when you were not vaccinated. But then there's this question of, okay, well, it's not 100% effective, right? It's 95% in some cases or some percent lower than 100. And, and to be honest, there is no vaccine that's 100% effective. It, it, as far as I know, unless Bob can tell me otherwise, it doesn't exist. So the idea is, you know, while we're still waiting for more and more people to get vaccinated and the numbers to drop off till the virus is not as prevalent in um, public places among people, we sort of have to keep that that guard up. Now you as an individual, as a vaccinated individual, um, you know, your risk again is lower, but it's not zero. So just like with anything, you have to make some assessment about your own risk tolerance. And even while you may feel very protected, there is a small chance that you could transmit the virus, although less and less, more data is showing that that's less and less likely if you've been fully vaccinated that you can transmit. But until we know for sure, as Mark had pointed out, we probably should be wearing masks and still taking a lot of precautions. So I know that's maybe not the most direct answer, but I think it may clarify a couple of things about why sometimes the public health guidance differs from what it might, what might seem logical for you as an individual. And, and I think that's happening more and more now that people are getting vaccinated and wondering like, why am I needing to do everything that I was doing before? Like, why do I have to wait for the world to catch up on this? Um, why can't I do this? And you can, but you do have to understand what your own risks are and you should be ready to take precautions to prevent any small chance of you being able to transmit to others as well. And does anybody else have comments on that? Um, not really, Dr. Erhard. I think you um, uh, uh, nailed that uh, answer. Um, I, again, um, the data is, um, does, is uh, emerging that uh, the chances of, of uh, transmitting virus after vaccination seems to be low, but that data is incomplete. So again, um, I would err on the side of caution. And I would agree too that uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the last very few months, and we've only had vaccines for very few months. And uh, as we start rolling more of this out, more of the population becomes vaccinated, then we'll be able to make a better uh, evaluation of what we should be able to do and what we should still avoid in the near future and then in the more distant future. So I think everything that, that has been said has been right on, but keep in mind that uh, we're, we're following the science and the, the conclusions may change a little bit as we go forward. It may relax. It may uh, say, whoop, we may be overstepped a little bit. Let's back off some. I hope that doesn't happen. I, I'm, I'm happy going forward with what we've got right now. We just have to watch and make sure that's still, we're still on the right track. Absolutely. All right. Next question. Is there any reason why someone should have a preference for one manufacturer's vaccine over another? Or should we all take whatever vaccine is offered for us at our time? For example, I've heard some people say they don't want the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it has a lower percent effectiveness. Can you decline the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and still remain on the list to receive the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines? Yeah, whoever, thank you for that question. Whoever submitted that, that's a great question right now and really, really timely. 
Um, so I'll answer the last question first. Can you decline J&J &J and then still remain on the list to receive the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines? To my knowledge, that the answer to that is no, not in Colorado, at least at this time, although as Bob pointed out, boy, the boy, it's changing all the time, right? So, um, but, and then the part about, should we take whichever vaccine is available to us? The answer I would say is a resounding yes, please do that because the more people that are vaccinated, the quicker we get out of this pandemic situation and begin to get back to normal. Um, one of the things that people have been very um, vocal about in the media is these efficacy percentages. So you've heard Moderna and Pfizer efficacy in their phase three trials was 95% and the J&J &J vaccine, I can't remember what they are saying, somewhere in that 70 or some, some percentage lower than the Moderna and Pfizer. And that's what's causing some of this discussion to happen in the public. But the but it's very, very important to remember that you cannot compare those like they're apples to apples, because what happens, especially in this situation, is Moderna and Pfizer were kind of first out of the gate in creating their phase three um, trial information. So they were uh, enrolling people much sooner than J&J &J was enro enrolling people. And the climate has changed, right? When Moderna and Pfizer were enro enrolling people, there really weren't these variants in the U.S., J&J &J actually started doing their um, vaccine um, research in other countries, and, uh, and that's where the, the variants were. So I would caution you to say it's not, it's not possible to compare those um, at head-to-head, -head, those efficacies. The other thing that's really important to remember is that in all cases, all three approved vaccines in the U.S. have prevented um, hospitalization and severe disease, and that's really what we need. We, you know, if the coronavirus, if COVID becomes more like a common cold and there's enough people that are vaccinated and then protected against dis severe disease and hospitalization, we have achieved our goal. Like that's, that is just fine. Um, it'd be great if we could eradicate it, but we don't need to eradicate SARS-CoV-2 from the planet to get out of the pandemic or even to control the disease. So the, that's a long answer to the short answer, which is uh, if you have an opportunity to get any of those vaccines, um, as long as it's health, your doctor has said you're healthy enough to receive them, you should absolutely um, take advantage of that and, and receive those vaccines at, as soon as you can. Great, thank you. Um, it's my understanding that vaccines don't provide total immunity from the virus. Is any work being done on in-home testing and developing additional or better treatment for the virus? I'll take a stab. Um, so as uh, um, Dr. Earhart uh, just said in her last um, answer, no, no vaccine um, is 100% effective, uh, but I would say that these three vaccines that are currently available um, are tremendously effective. Uh, I think, Bob, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the most effective vaccine that I know of is the measles vaccine. It's about 98% effective uh, and um, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines approach that. So uh, considering how fast these were rolled out, that is incredible. Um, and again, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, uh, again, the, the efficacy uh, uh, percentages are not directly comparable, uh, as uh, Dr. Earhart said, uh, but it does have its own advantages over um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Um, it uses a very tried and true platform uh, that has been proven safe uh, among a huge range of, of the population. And it's only um, a, a one-shot vaccine uh, so that uh, you don't have to worry about compliance of getting that second uh, jab. Um, although I am very uh, encouraged that the compliance for that second shot is also outstanding for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, having said that, uh, all three of those vaccines um, have been shown to be 100% effective in preventing um, severe disease and preventing hospitalizations, both of which uh, um, are huge because that, that lessens the strain on our healthcare workers. Um, and, you know, um, it, it reduces the the effects of COVID to something that's certainly more manageable. You know, um, you may get sick, but it's not life-threatening. So even that advance, 100% um, of people receiving those vaccines 
um, are protected essentially from hospitalizations uh, and from that most severe disease that is life-threatening. Uh, so yes, I would continue to um, advocate for taking any of them that, that become available uh, when, they, when your uh, turn comes up. Well, I'll uh, go right along with what has been said previously by both uh, Dr. Earhart, Dr. Zabel, and add just a little bit to it. The emphasis on the percentage of uh, prevention of the disease should go right along with the emphasis on prevention of severity of the disease. And, and Dr. Zabel mentioned that a little bit too, and I think Dr. Earhart did, but all of these vaccines that are now approved in the US really have a huge, huge benefit on preventing severeness of the disease. And uh, when since we're on a healthy aging panel here, we're thinking mostly about people probably in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever your decades on earth are, uh, the vaccines are really going to help prevent the severity of disease that some of us in the 60, 70, 80 year range had seen statistics that were really scary. So this is helping. And the other thing that they help is it's been shown that yes, you can possibly be infected, but if you are, you may not ever experience disease. You probably won't transmit because the amount of virus present is going to be much, much less than the amount of virus if you have the active disease. And uh, Ali, I think I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into another question on here. And that has to do with boosters. If you get either the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine now, does that mean you should get that same booster if a booster is recommended? And yes, everything that we've seen so far says stick with that uh, same vaccine. And I don't know that you've really got a choice at this particular time, but uh, make sure you get the same one because that's what the data have been worked out for is that particular vaccine. Uh, you know that uh, Pfizer is a three week interval from primary to secondary vaccination. Moderna is a, a four week interval from primary to secondary. And at this time, J&J &J is not recommending a booster, but stick with the same one. And when you, in Colorado at least, and, and this is the place I'm most familiar with, although I have heard from uh, uh, friends in, in a few other states that when you get that first vaccination, you are uh, scheduled for your second one if one's required at that particular time. So stick with it and make sure you get that same one. Thank you. Um, I do have a clarification from the uh, previous question and it is, um, they were asking about what development of any uh, in-home testing or treatments that do you guys know about? Um, there are a couple of uh, new treatments that are being explored right now that I've heard some very promising early data from. Um, so that's great. And I know that even on our campus, CSU researchers are looking at different kinds of antivirals that have been proven safe and used for other, vac uh, other viral infections in terms of trying to understand if they will also work in, in the SARS-CoV-2 case. And there have been some very promising early data there. Um, and uh, the in-home testing, again, there's a ton being, uh, being developed right now, like more than you could possibly even count. Um, but there are a couple that are just getting very, very close to being approved um, that will be a lot more accurate than some of the over-the-counter antigen um, tests, which are sort of the, 15 minute tests. Um, so, you know, I think we're going to be flooded pretty soon with the, the testing opportunities or the testing platforms. Um, Mark, do you have more info on the uh, antivirals and, and things? Do you want to share some of that? Um, unfortunately, I don't, Nicole, I, um, but I do. I, I was just going to echo what you said about um, CSU's efforts to test uh, um, current FDA approved antiviral drugs. Uh, a, um, a colleague and good friend of mine, um, Dr. Rashika Pereira, uh, is, is leading those efforts at CSU. Uh, and the, 
the cool thing about her work is that she's t testing unique combinations of antivirals that ha haven't been used in combination before. Um, and uh, I think she has some promising results. But the, the great thing is that, that, you know, even though this is being, this work is being conducted in a basic research lab, because these drugs are FDA approved already, they're just being repurposed. And so they don't have to go through the same um, uh, uh, trials and, and approval process for FDA. Uh, and so once they get some firm data that shows they are effective, that then um, the FDA and the CDC can announce, you know, that these drugs could be used um, effectively against coronavirus. So that's, that's all great news. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add is uh, about the home testing kits. And Nicole, absolutely right. They're just exploding right now. You know, you can go to your local um, King Super and get a saliva-based test. Now, this isn't that 15-minute antigen test that, you know, isn't um, as accurate as some of these more sensitive assays. Uh, um, this over-the-counter test is um, a saliva-based one that you have you do have to send in. So you have to send in by mail. It takes um, several days to get those results back. But that is a very sensitive and accurate test. Um, and so that is available at your local grocery store right now. Um, the antigen test, I think, is too, but it's not quite as accurate. So um, depending on your urgency, if, if, you, if you can wait for a few days to get a a more definitive, accurate test, uh, then that saliva-based over-the-counter test might might be the appropriate one for you. Great, thank you. Um, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, how is it different and why does it only need one dose? I also heard it can alter my DNA rather than using the mRNA. Will it affect my genes? Okay, I'll take the first uh, stab at that one. None of the vaccines that are approved in the US or any that I've seen that are approved anywhere else. And even some of the ones that are in development that haven't been approved anywhere else in the world, none of those alter your DNA. They're, they are not based on DNA, on changing your genetics at all. The Johnson & Johnson is a different platform than the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine are mRNA based, messenger RNA does not change your DNA. It just sends a message to your RNA and your protein factories to produce some virus antigen. Those antigens are produced, which stimulates your immune system to then produce the uh, antibody and cellular immune response. The Johnson & Johnson has a protein from the spike protein of the coronavirus that is inserted into another a virus. It's a, an adenovirus. It's a very, very common virus. It causes colds in humans. This adenovirus that they're using is not a human adenovirus. It was derived from primates, non-human primates, but uh, it's not known to cause any disease in humans. But what it does is it serves as a carrier for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, it gets it to your immune system. And because of the, the virus, the other virus that it's carried on, it helps stimulate the immune system. And then you develop an immunity against uh, the adenovirus to a certain extent, but especially against the spike protein from the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So that's how they differ. It's a delivery a difference in the antigen delivery system. Uh, but I don't know where this uh, tail started, but somewhere it got picked up and people are saying, oh, it's going to change your DNA and, and all kinds of things are going to happen with it. No, it absolutely does not. And uh, the Pfizer vaccine so far is the one that is out there that has not been recommended for, uh, not the Pfizer, the J&J, &J, I'm sorry. The J and J vaccine is the, so far a one dose only, but I know there are some studies going on to see if maybe it would be better as a booster. Also, uh, back to Dr. Earhart's comment or Dr. Zabel's comments, both of them on uh, the efficacy of vaccines. Yes, the measles vaccine is very, very, very high efficacy. Hepatitis B vaccine in humans is also 
right up there in the 95 to 98 percent. And uh, since the hepatitis B is a modified live virus, it's actually a crippled hepatitis B virus that stimulates the immunity. It gives you a very long lasting immunity. So uh, these, these vaccines that are out now and approved in the US are extremely efficacious compared to a lot of other vaccines, especially even compared to the normal seasonal flu vaccines. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and, and just to address the last part of that question about why the J&J &J vaccine um, is only recommended or requires one dose and the Pfizer Moderna vaccines require two. I, again, they are different platforms as um, uh, Dr. Ellis uh, mentioned. And um, while I, I, I think that some of the data from those vaccines um, has not been fully uh, released to the public, um, as an immunologist, um, on, on uh, face value, I would say that uh, the fact that um, another very safe virus delivers that antigen that your immune system will react to, rather than just that mRNA that's packaged into liposomes, which is just a, a little small um, piece of, of fat, essentially, um, uh, it, the delivery of that um, antigen is probably a little bit more efficient in the J&J &J vaccine because uh, that's what viruses do. They're really good at getting inside your cells. And um, until these Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were approved um, using um, liposomes to deliver mRNA, you know, these, these new next generation vaccines uh, um, are really safe, but that, the really difficult part was trying to get them inside cells. And so uh, that's a huge step forward for future vaccine development too, is that both of these platforms um, have developed a delivery system that does work, uh, although they do require boosting. Um, so, so those liposomes likely do not deliver the antigen quite as effectively as that um, uh, harmless modified virus uh, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine platform uses. Um, if we know people can be asymptomatic, why do they still screen for temperature everywhere I go? Well, that's a good, that's a really good question. Thanks to whoever submitted that question. Um, so yeah, um, there are of course people that have no symptoms and therefore would not have a fever, but um, you know it's important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? If some if a recommendation doesn't work for everybody, it doesn't mean it's a bad recommendation. And so screening for fever is one way to know if someone's actually sick. So it may not be it may not catch everybody, but the hope is that it will catch some individuals, and that's why we use it. It's you know the nice thing about screening for fever; it's completely non-invasive, especially with the new scanner type fever, you know, that go on your forehead or just across your skin that everybody's been using. I mean, that's a very nice way to at least try to make sure that no one's coming in who's actually very ill. Um, and then yes, will it catch everybody? No, it will not catch everyone. So. I think that any any kind of approach that we're using to prevent infection or prevent exposure to others um, has to be layered on to other things. So that's why we use masks and that's why we screen for fevers. Um, but it doesn't mean that any one thing is going to be 100% foolproof. So that's how I would answer that question. Great, thank you. Let's see. This was another uh, question about the vaccines. Are uh, any and or all of the vaccines safe for children? Or any in particular that are safer? That is also a great question. Uh, and uh, um, uh, again, um, most of the, uh, all three of the approved vaccines um, have not been um, evaluated uh, in, in very young children. Although I do know that Moderna is starting those, um, those studies on, I believe, children fr uh, from two years to 12 years old, I believe. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, it might be even earlier than that. Um, but uh, this is the first of the three uh, uh, currently approved vaccines that's going to try to 
uh, test um, efficacy in, in children. I'll just reiterate again that all three of the vaccines that have been approved, especially the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, uh, that's one of the real uh, advantages of these types of vaccines is that they're so safe. They don't, they don't use, as Dr. Ellis uh, mentioned previously, an, an attenuated or, or a, um, a weakened uh, virus. Uh, so there's no chance um, that you can get some sort of infection from the RNA, mRNA vaccines because they have no living component to it. Um, but even that J and J vaccine, uh, as uh, Bob said, uses a um, a really tried and true, very safe um, uh, virus to to transmit uh, the antigen against coronavirus, and that also is extremely safe. So I'm, I was glad to see that Moderna is starting those trials just to confirm um, the efficacy and safety in in very young children. So all three of those should be um, very safe. Uh, these are some of those experiments that we would typically see in phase three clinical trials um, and, and would add you know, months, if not years to the approval process. And so um, I can appreciate why uh, the FDA allowed these to be used um, for emergency use authorization. Um, but as I've been saying over and over, um, a lot of the data that we normally would collect during a phase three clinical trial, we are collecting right now. But um, again, Pfizer Moderna vaccines, that's one of the huge advantages of, of this type of platform is its safety. And I would like to uh, second that. It's, it, they really are safe. And the, the, one of the other safe aspects that has been brought up from time to time is what about the possibility of anaphylaxis, allergic reactions to the vaccines? And uh, those of you who have been vaccinated know that you're supposed to stay there. They don't let you leave for about 15 minutes at least after receiving the vaccination. And that is to just check to see if you may be having any allergic response, any anaphylactic response. There have been some anaphylactic responses noted and they've been easily treated. There haven't been any uh, really long-term effects due to allergies or anaphylactic responses uh, to any of these three vaccines that are approved here in the U.S. So again, they've, they've proven to be really safe. The interesting thing is, is going to be, and as I mentioned earlier, the science or the data are going to change as we go further through this. Remember, we just started vaccinating in December in the US and that was with Moderna and then Pfizer was approved and now J&J &J is approved. So as the months and the months and maybe we get to years go by, uh, people are assessed for their antibody response. The antibody responses have shown some really, really great responses in people that have been followed for the past few months, but we need to see what more is going to happen as far as uh, are we going to need some booster shots later on? We don't know that yet. Uh, it's just going to see what happens as far as uh, what's going to happen in the future. And the other thing that's a little bit of an unknown is the variants of these viruses. And the, the variants are occurring because that's what viruses do. They replicate themselves so quickly inside of host cells that there are going to be some uh, misprints as far as the replication of the RNA of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and the same with most any other virus. They, some of those viruses will uh, mutate to where they're non-viable and those just get pitched out the, with, with the other cellular garbage. But those that are viable, so far the vaccines have been efficacious against those variants also. Uh, and we're still looking and still really around the world, there are data places that are looking at sequencing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of these viruses constantly to compare and make sure that they're still covered by the vaccines. If we find one that needs to be changed, then with the mRNA vaccines, it's a little bit easier to change and cover 
those variants than it is with some of the other platforms. So we've got that option going, uh, which is a very positive option with the two Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Yeah, and I just wanted to echo, that's exactly right, Bob. Um, that is one of the main reasons why you don't wanna play around with herd immunity by um, just exposure. Because even if um, you know, that happens among young adults that typically won't get very sick, um, it does provide an opportunity for the virus to replicate and to mutate. So the more um, uh, uh, opportunities the virus has to do that, the more it will do that. And that's what we're seeing with these variants that are emerging. So you know, getting herd immunity just simply by exposure is a super bad idea. It's so much better to get it safely through vaccinations. We wanna definitely limit the number of people that are exposed to the virus to limit the virus's chance to mutate. Great, thank you guys. And I uh, just wanted to note that Dr. Davalos uh, posted that NPR article she was talking about in the chat and we'll include that in our recording video as well. Um, C, I've been avoiding getting takeout because I'm afraid of someone who is sick handling my food. Is it safe to go to my favorite takeout? Well, I'll answer that by saying I am a total food safety advocate and yet I'm comfortable getting takeout food for a couple of reasons. We have a year's worth of information now, but evidence hasn't emerged that links food or food packaging with transmission of this virus. And also retail food businesses have put a number of precautions in place. They have the plexiglass barriers, employees are masked. They in, um, encourage physical you know, distancing and limit sometimes the number of people that can come in at any one time. And those are the reasons that I'm comfortable with it. And I've been you know, doing research on this, checking out multiple places. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really seeing strong evidence that the, the precautions are being followed. So I, I, can give you, I can give you that as evidence. Thanks. In the same vein, uh, we heard a lot of stories about uh, meat packing plants being affected. Um, do I need to worry about any meat that was frozen during that time? Okay, well, on that, I'm also gonna point to evidence. So um, it's true that there were a number of cases associated with meat processing facilities and uh, several studies took a, took a look at that. There was a large study of 36 states and they did over a three month period early on in the pandemic. And the, um, what they determined was it's a high density workplace. People work closely together for extended periods of time and that was facilitating the transmission along with some other circumstances in that employees were often um, also sharing transportation or in a, you know, carpooling to work together or socializing after work, or even they had um, shared housing. They were from the same household. So all of those things contributed to, um, to the transmission of the virus. As far as it, should you be concerned about the meat, uh, there have been some studies conducted and you know, taking a look at that and they're not finding regularly, routinely finding uh, any contamination on, on meat of this virus. But I would also point out that um, as long as you're following the precautions that you need to be for the, the pathogens that we know are foodborne and are frequently associated with meat, then you will be protected. So that, that's good news. This, you have control. You, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's up to you if you are following uh, the good precautions in, in terms of not handling, you know, um, when you purchase meat, put it in a bag so it doesn't touch other food in your cart. You know, uh, the same goes in the refrigerator, keep it separated from ready to eat foods, cook it to the proper temperature, wash your hands after handling meat. All those precautions are gonna help protect you from the pathogens that we know may be there. And, um, but there, and there's no evidence pointing to the fact that, that that is one of the methods of transmission of this virus. I think I, I think I, covered the questions related to that. I 
think so. All right. Uh, I heard that AstraZeneca vaccine is being discontinued in some places in Europe due to due to causing blood clots. Why are some countries stopping giving it and others continuing? Oh, so good. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so the AstraZeneca vaccine was discontinued. You've heard about it in the um, in the news in some of the European countries and other, and there was an Asian country, I believe, because there were a very small number of people that uh, they did that developed blood clots. There was, I think, I can't remember the number. There was only one death. Everybody else survived. So the question was, could this possibly be a result of the vaccine? So AstraZeneca has not been approved in the U.S., but it has been approved in other countries. And interestingly, today, the EU, um, European Union, just came out with their the results of their in investigation about whether or not they felt this was vaccine related. And it turns out that the number of people that actually had this issue of blood clots was no higher than the number of blood clots you would expect to see in the general population uh, in the same number of people. So blood clots can happen for lots of different reasons. Um, and they do happen all the time. And so the question was, could this possibly be something related to the vaccine? And based on all of the research that was done so far, the answer is no, um, that it wasn't due to the vaccine. At least there's no evidence that it was causal or that there was an association. Um, the US still has not received, the FDA has not received all of AstraZeneca's final phase three trial. The, um, so they have not submitted that to our approval agency, the FDA, and the FDA is certainly aware of what their concern was with uh, AstraZeneca. So they will be, I'm sure, exploring that very, very carefully, but, um, but it doesn't sound like there was a lot of evidence that, that there was a causation from the vaccine, that this was just, you know, a random number of people would have had blood clots anyway, and some number of them had also had that vaccine. And so that's why the question was, was posed, but doesn't seem to have much evidence behind it. So good news. That is good news. Um, since we know that, so since we know now that touching contaminated surfaces is not the main way the COVID virus is spread, why is everyone still so obsessed with spraying things down, cleaning surfaces and no contact payments? Well, I think this was pretty well covered before um, by Marissa, but um, there, there are still some good reasons for cleaning surfaces. For example, I go to the senior center when it's open and work out there and, uh, and hang on to handles that a lot of other people hang on to for the various weight type machines or the stationary bikes or anything like that in, in that area that's common use. And way before, well, when, when I first started doing this many, many years ago, it was still, uh, people were asked to wipe down those machines before and after your use. Just makes common sense to not pass on any pathogens that you might have on your hands uh, that uh, you would pass on to somebody else. So I think that's one of the good reasons. And it's not just because of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 that we're doing this. There are lots of other pathogens that are out there. Uh, the same, kind of the same principles that were talked about with food safety. If you follow good safety on these kinds of issues where other people are going to be touching all of that, then it stands to reason that you're going to be preventing disease, uh, whether or not it's uh, COVID that gets spread that way. COVID we know now is essentially spread by respiratory uh, reasons or respiratory roots. So uh, possibly wiping these down isn't going to help prevent COVID all that much, but it could definitely help with other reasons. Just good common cleanliness and good common hygiene practices. Great. How has COVID contributed to food insecurity? Is it mostly because people are out of jobs or is it because the distribution and food production were affected or both? Well, it seems that the, the, the drop in income appears to be the main factor that, that's impacted um, food insecurity because even though some products were limited and there were some shortages, for the most part, our um, markets have 
done a really good job of keeping this the shelves stocked, which hasn't been easy because more more people are cooking at home these days, and they're you know, but they're managing to keep up. So I would say it's that it's the drop in income, but then we saw the um, corresponding increase in offerings from food pantries, food banks, many you know pop up facilities that didn't exist before, and to meet that need for um, for food insecurity, for meeting making increasing food security. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Great. Right. Um, let's see, we have one more question for Dr. Davalos. Um, let's see if we, we still have some technical troubles. If I notice my 79 year old mother showing signs of stress and forgetfulness, when do I know whether to have her checked for dementia versus just accepting her explanation that she's stressed over COVID? Okay, I'm going to try no video. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, so I'll try and keep it brief. I would say the first sign of any symptom of concern, stress, forgetfulness, um, you should go and see someone. The, the, one of the most useful uh, tools that we have to help older adults, if there is any type of pathological aging, is a baseline neuropsychological exam. So if you take a loved one in and, they're, and you were wrong and it was just stress, that's still wonderful. It will help in terms of figuring out down the road if anything happens. Um, so I would say really any, and, and there are changes in the brain with stress. So even if somebody says, well, it's just stress, that doesn't mean that it hasn't had a negative impact on their brain. Um, so I would highly recommend first symptom, you take someone in at the aging clinic. We even have something called a brief assessment. If it's not a huge concern, but you just want to do a quick check. Um, so it's not even very time intensive if you want to do that for a loved one who's concerned. Great. And we can include a link to uh, the Aging Clinic of the Rockies website when we release the video as well. Um, looks like that is about time. So I'd like to thank our experts for sharing their knowledge and time with us today.